and the omnibus. So I was forced into the arches when I was a child. And look, it's come back to bite me later on. I'm awash with the stuff. The Archers is the world's longest running radio show, with more than 15,000 episodes broadcast. Despite being a rural flavour show, The Archers is recorded in the heart of the UK's second largest city, Birmingham. My castaway this week is the actress June Spencer. As Peggy Woolley in The Archers, she is one of the best loved matriarchs in broadcasting. It's 60 years this spring since she took on the role. Back then, The Archers was reckoned to be a Dick Barton for farmers, a programme not of actors playing roles, but of real people whose lives we were overhearing. She is the only original member of the cast still in the show, and over the years she has seen it all, alcoholism, gambling and bereavement, to name just a few. These days, she has one of the most demanding and moving storylines in the programme, caring for a husband as he succumbs to dementia. Now aged 90, it might be reasonable to speculate on whether she plans to retire any time soon. No way, she says, not until I fluff my lines or miss a cue. Um, the Archers then has this unique place in British life, June, and the idea is a really beguiling one that we somehow have an ear against the radio hearing a slice of real British rural life Given that you've played the part for so long, a lot of people must confuse you with Peggy, do they? I think sometimes they do. And I don't think we have all that much in common. I love my garden, though I can't do much in it these days. And Peggy loves her garden. And, of course, both had husbands with dementia. But uh, when people meet me, they say, oh, you look just like I thought you would. <laughs> <laughs> and you d I have to say, I mean, it, it is slightly rude to, to mention your age in the introduction, but I would put you at 70. I mean, you are in very, very good shape for a woman of 90. Well, thank you very much. You mentioned the similarities. What are the differences between you and Peggy? I don't think Peggy's got a sense of humour, and I hope I have. I think funny things sometimes happen to Peggy, but... She doesn't see the funny side of things, I'm afraid. It is 60 years then since the programme was launched. Do you remember, you were originally engaged for how many episodes? Um, we did a week's trial just to sort of test the water. And that was in uh, 1950. And then we didn't hear any more until January the 1st, the following year, 1951. And I think we were given a contract for three months. Did you think when you heard the idea and saw the scripts that it had the flavour of a, a long-running series to it? No, I didn't, not at all, no, especially at the fee they were paying. <laughs> How much was it? Um, well, there were three stages. There was the top rate, which I was on, because I'd done a lot of broadcasting before the Archer started, and that was £12 for five episodes. And the next one was £10, and even £8. Um, Although you say there are differences and significant ones between uh, you and Peggy Woolley, one of the main ones being that you've got a sense of humour and hers seems suspiciously absent, <laughs> um, you both seem to share a sort of steely determination. I mean, still to be doing what you're doing at 90 and to sustain a career in acting, the most precarious of professions, means that you must have quite a core of steel, I reckon. Yes, I think, uh, well, I, I don't know when I'm beaten, you see. <laughs> well, I love acting so much. I... I I'm so lucky to have a job that I can still do. It's a great bonus for me that the Archers has run as long as it has and I've gone along with it. Let's have some music then. Tell me about the first disc that we're going to hear today, June. I'd like to be reminded of my wartime years. On the run-up to the war, my teenage years were, were a bit muddled because I left school early to look after my mother. My mother's health wasn't good. At the same time, I was just beginning to do the things I really wanted to do. I was uh, studying drama. And at the same time, we young people, we teenagers, we knew that there was a war coming. And the music that brings it back to me most is Fred Astaire and Let's Face the Music and Duck. Oh, June Spencer, as we know, you've enjoyed this very long and successful career, but your first forays into show business were really as a sort of comedy entertainer. I'm thinking more in the sort of 
Joyce Grenfell or even Victoria Wood m- mould to bring it bang up to date, where you would you would construct these comedy monologues and things. T- tell me more about that. Yes, I'd always written funny things to amuse myself. My father knew this, and uh, I think he said to somebody, oh, yes, my daughter um, does humorous monologues. And somebody said, oh, well, we have entertainment after dinner at Masonic evenings. Would she do that? I just enjoyed doing it. I made them laugh, and that's what I like doing. It sounds terrifying, the idea of stepping out in front of a bunch of, I'm presuming if it was Masonic Lodges, just men, who were saying, go Mm. on then, make us laugh. Were you terrified? No, it wasn't. They were all in a good mood. They'd had a good dinner and a few drinks. (laughs) They laughed easily. And did you find the writing easy as well? Yes, I did. Once I started, it it flowed. In fact, um, French has published my book of monologues. I used to write for Cyril Fletcher, odd odes, so there's rather saucy odd odes. So have you continued writing throughout your career? Is it always something that you felt the need to do, or did you um, stop once you were working on I, the arches? I more or less stopped when I had children. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did write, um, yes, this was before the children, though. I wrote three uh, satirical uh, feature programmes which were broadcast. So you were born, uh, we'll rewind a little, you were born six months after the end of the First World War. Yes. Um, home was Nottingham. Uh, what was home life like? What kind of house did you live in? I had a very happy childhood. I was born in a three-storey semi-detached rented house. I had a day nursery and a night nursery. I was very lucky. And I had a rocking horse, which I loved. It sounds a little bit posh, is it? Well, it was a very second-hand rocking horse, I'm quite sure, because my father was earning about, I think, under £400 a year at that time. And what sort of character was your father? Oh, my father was... um, He was a lovely, reliable, sensible chap. He was always very supportive of me, and and of my mother too, because my mother, when she was about 40, decided she was an invalid. So it was my father, really, who did everything for me. Um, More about your mother later on, but for now, more about you as a little girl. You've said in interviews that you were as young as three when you were stage-struck. Tell me what happened. Yes, well, when I was barely three, I was cast as King of the Land of Nod in a play. It was an open-air thing. On my cue, they sort of sent me out. The leading lady, who was 12, said... He doesn't speak, he only smiles. Upon which I said, oh, look, there's Daddy in the audience. <laughs> so he does speak. <laughs> and I followed that rapidly with, oh, Mummy, it's raining. And I got another laugh. So I think I've, that's when I heard my first laughs and obviously enjoyed them. <laughs> uh, do you remember actually enjoying them? Or was that your... your oh, appearance? I remember it. Oh, yes. Do you? Clearly. What was the feeling? Oh, it wasn't a fee, No. It was all amateur. No, what was the feeling? What feeling oh, I'm sorry, you said, get? what was the feeling? <laughs> My mind does run on money, doesn't it? <laughs> um, yes, I can see them all in front of me laughing. And you thought, I want a bit more of this. <laughs> yes, I must have done. Let's have some more music then, June. Tell me about your second disc today. Well, the second one is to remind me of my father. I passed by your window. He used to sing it to me. Sometimes if I couldn't go to sleep, he'd come and sing it. But this I associate with my father. I passed by your window when the morning was red the dew on the rose but the lark on the head and oh I sang softly though no one could hear forbid you could
That was Nelson Eddy and I passed by your window and memories there, June Spencer, of your father sometimes, what did he do, hold your hand and sing it to you to get you off to sleep? Yes, he did, (laughs) yes. And your parents used to hold little sort of musical soirees at home? Yes, they had uh, musical evenings. People sang or played an instrument. So I used to lie in bed at night, drift off to sleep, hearing all these old ballads and songs. And your parents also, I understand, had a, a motorbike with a sidecar. What, what do you remember of that? Well, we had that when I was about four, I would think. Did you watch them go off in it? Presumably you weren't in it too, were you? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Where um, did you sit? On my mother's knee. And uh, there wasn't a top to it. So if it was raining, she had a tarpaulin, which she sort of wedged <laughs> behind her back and held over her head. I don't know, her arms must have been aching for it to drop off. And uh, we used to go miles in that, went up to London, all sorts of things. Was it terrifying or exhilarating? Well, it was it was all right for me. It must have been awful for my parents. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as a little girl, you used to write plays. We know you were very much sort of stage-struck when you were two or three, and you, you started penning your own plays and getting your getting your chums involved. Oh yes, when I was when I was twelve I started a club and I made the costumes and we charged admission and we made twelve shillings and sixpence in old money, which went to Doctor Bernardo's. And you yourself made all the costumes. Did yes. mu- did mum lend a hand? Oh no, no. No, she was co opted. My parents were co opted for the actual performance to work the curtains and to make sound effects off stage and that sort of thing. Um, you find out later that, that uh, your mother indeed sort of hankered after a career in, in the performing arts. What, what do you know of that? Well, I know my, I heard many years later that my mother would have loved to have gone on the stage and she would have made a beautiful soubrette in musical comedy. She could sing, she was slender and dainty and loose-limbed. She could do high kicks and uh, splits. But for some reason, she did not want me to go on the stage. But when I finally uh, made it into rep, she said, oh, well, I suppose it was meant, <laughs> and became my sternest critic. Did she? Oh, yes, very, very stern, yes, very critical. One of my favourite roles was Alexandra in The Little Foxes. Years later, she said... Well, it wasn't until I saw the film that I realised how good you were in it. That's thought, something of a backhanded yes, compliment. That's, yes, I thought, yes. <laughs> Had to wait a long time for that one. <laughs> Do you think there's a possibility that, that she, she resented the fact that you were having the life that she would have liked? It's possible. I mean, she just gave up on life. She decided she was an invalid. I mean, she missed so much. Tell me about that, her deciding to be an invalid. What happened? Well, I think she thought she'd got heart trouble. She was very anemic and she thought she had a heart problem and uh, she took to her bed. She liked me there all the time in case she had one of these attacks that she had. So I would sit in her bedroom with the curtains closed because she didn't like the bright light. But um, it was very frustrating for a teenager. And you've said she she thought she was ill. I mean, is is it is it your view that this was largely sort of hypochondriacal, that she sort of confected something to deal I with? I think she didn't face up to it. And I don't think the medical care she was getting helped, it rather encouraged her. And my father rather encouraged her as well. He was just so worried about her. He was a bit over fussy with her, I think. I mean, and she was only in her early 40s? Yes, yes. And how long did she live like this? Until she was 94. And so did she, uh, once your father had passed away, did she live alone like that? This no, by that time existence? they were living with us uh, because my father had gone blind. And when my father died, of course, my mother stayed on. And finally I, I got her into a, a very nice residential home where she bucked up no end and uh, started going for walks on her own. She'd never been out of the house without being supported on both sides for years. Did you ever have it out with her? Did you ever tell her what you thought and, and said to her, come on, I think No, of course not. You didn't? No, no. Let's have some music then. Tell me about your third disc today. What have you chosen? Well, the third one is uh, Chopin's Revolutionary Study. I started music lessons, piano lessons, when I was six, and I loved playing. And I went on playing until I was about 15 or 16 when I had to stop practising my two hours a day because Mother couldn't stand the noise because she was lying up in bed. 
I was never going to be a, a brilliant pianist, but I do love hearing piano played well, hence the revolutionary. Or was declared. For, yes. for you personally, what, what did that mean? Well, when uh, the Germans marched into Poland, my mother and I were on holiday in the south of England somewhere. So my father drove down to collect us because the trains were full of little evacuees going off to, they didn't know where, their gas masks and their, their labels, their names, to say where they were going. And did you have a sense of uh, foreboding, or given that you were only 20, did it all seem like something of, of, of an adventure? No, not at all. It, 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 saddened, it saddened me very much. I kept thinking of my boyfriends who would be called up and going. And but I don't think there was any of the, the sort of gung-ho spirit that was in the First World War. And when did you meet Roger? When we were both 17, on holiday, in Chapel St. Leonard's, which is a little village on the east coast near Skegness. And my parents used to rent a bungalow for a month, and his parents used to rent a bungalow for a month. And we, that's how we met. And when did you marry? Not until 1942. I had lots of other boyfriends and he had other girlfriends. It wasn't until the war and he came home on leave that um, he, he caught me in a weak moment and I said yes. <laughs> because originally, on the, uh, when we were 17 on this holiday, I'd said to him rather loftily, I'll be your girlfriend for the duration of the holiday, but after that, finish. I can't bear these holiday romances that peter out during the winter. Never, never a wiser for, word. Married for 59 years. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your wedding then, because if you got married in the, in the middle of the war, presumably it was quite a modest affair, was it? Um, yes, it was, yes. I mean, he was in uniform, of course, and uh, Mother and I went down to Griffin and Spaulding's and they had one wedding dress in my size, and it was seven guineas, so I had that. And we had a very modest reception, a terrible wedding cake. I couldn't have ice, icing on the cake. You had to have... Um, what would they call it, that paper stuff. It looked like... Rice paper? Was rice paper, it? that's it, yes. Had a much better um, wedding cake when I married Jack Woolley. <laughs> <laughs> the Arches had a beautiful wedding cake. You've then. still got one of the tears from that. I you? have, yes. yes. Let's take a break for some music then. Tell me about your next track. We're on number four now. Debussy's En Bateau, which uh, is to remind me of one of my very earliest broadcasts about the families who worked the canal boats. And my father was... Wilfred Pickles. So Roger then was was posted to, to India and to Burma? Yes. Mm -hmm. How did it go while he was away? You must have missed him terribly. Yes, well, I was still living at home until a few months before he was due to come home. Then I broke away and went up to London because I was getting a lot of work in London at that time. And I got a home for him there. It was one great big room and uh, use of the bathroom two floors up and that's where all the water came from in a jug you know and slopped back in a bucket can you remember the, the day that you saw roger again yes i can yes i met him at the station he came in late at night i'd laid a table with all our best wedding presents and everything all the silver and the glass and everything and my rations such as they were i remember a dish with with a little bit of butter in it you see and when he arrived, he was absolutely bushed, of course, he was so tired. And he said, oh, what a miserable bit of butter. I said, that's my whole week's ration. <laughs> he had no idea of what rationing was. Uh, and how did you and Roger get on when he came back from the war? Because for a lot of couples, it, it was uh, tricky to readjust. I mean, you know, young women had had their freedom and had been living relatively yes. independent lives. How, how did both mm. of you find it? Yes, it, it, it was difficult, especially for him because he'd gone into the army before he'd finished his degree course and originally he was supposed to go back and finish it but of course he didn't want to do that he was he was 26 he was a major by which time of course i was a very busy radio actress doing very well so it was difficult for him to adjust but we'd always been good friends apart from anything else you know so i mean we got we got on well together we had fun so we we sort of picked up the threads again mm. And what did he think of you maintaining your, your acting career? Was he quite comfortable with that? Oh, he was. He was very supportive. Was yes. he? No, he was very supportive, always. Let's have some more music then. Tell me what we've got next. Well, this is to remind me of my bolt hole in Menorca. It's the adagio from... Important to remember, June Spencer, of course, these days the, the Arches is recorded and edited and it all sounds beautifully smooth, but when you were starting out in radio, must all have been live, was it? It was live, yes. 
a bit nerve-wracking at times? Um, it could be rather, yes, especially when uh, a producer would uh, tiptoe into the studio while you were at the microphone, actually, on air, lean over your shoulder and, with a pencil, cut several of the next speeches that you were going to say <laughs> and then tiptoe out again. I don't know how we got through, but we did. Yes. Great days, great fun. And so let's dance forward a little bit. You'd established yourself in The Archers as, first of all, of course, Peggy Archer. Um, You played a good few characters in the beginning uh, as well. There was a point at which, though, you you stepped back and it was a time for for family. You you adopted two children. Yes, in 1952, I think it was, uh, we adopted David, who was just a year old. And then two and a half years later, we adopted little Roz as well. But when David had settled in, I was able to work at weekends when Roger was with him, so that was all right. And when they were tiny children, before you went back to work, did I mean, so many of us as mothers find that we automatically start behaving in the way that our mother behaved to us. What sort of mother were you? Did you try to be a different mother from yours? Well, yes, I did. They ran rings round me, quite honestly. I mean, they're a couple of little devils. They really were, but absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> I mentioned in the introduction that, of course, one of the uh, storylines in recent years in The Archer that has caused a a lot of comment and and has been very moving for many people to listen to is um, the situation with your on-air husband of of Jack beginning to suffer dementia and then it becoming Mm. very, very pronounced. Yes. Um, Your own husband, Roger, who you were with Mm. uh, for 59 years in the latter part of your marriage, he developed Alzheimer's. Can you tell me a little about that? Yes, he began to... uh, I noticed it about the time of our golden wedding. His memory was playing him false. And it got steadily worse and worse. And uh, the repetitive questions started, which I think is almost the most wearing part of it, because they ask you a question and you answer it. And a few moments later, they ask you the same question again. And the day before, Roger, your husband died, you had a sort of something of a golden day, did you not? Yes, We were in the garden yes. together. Tell me about that. Yes, it was a beautiful day, lovely spring day in May, and all the, the garden was looking lovely. And I said, it's such a lovely day, let's, let's go and have lunch in the garden. And uh, I made a nice salad, and we had a, a bottle of chilled white wine. He was very amused, I remember, because I'd, I'd put it in a big vase with, with, with ice at the bottom. I said, well, that's, that's my wine chiller. He kept on saying, isn't this lovely? What a lovely lunch. It was such a happy, such a happy day. Let's have some music. Tell me about uh, the next piece of music. We're on disc number six now, June. I'd like to hear dear old Harry Seacombe sing opera. I met him when we did songs of praise in the Balearics. He had a house in Mallorca and of course I had this one in Menorca and he and the crew came over and I said to him uh, you often sing to me while you, while I'm here you know. Oh he said looking very surprised so I went and fetched one of my tapes which was operatic arias and there was Callas and Domingo and Carreras and Seacum <laughs> and he said oh I'm in good company. <laughs>
della vita. Harry Seacombe and the stars were brightly shining from Puccini's Tosca. So, June Spencer, as we know, your husband Roger died in 2001, and the following year, the decision was made for your on-air husband, Jack, to develop dementia. What did you think when the, the script editors told you of their plans? Well, Vanessa was very good, Vanessa Whitburn, our editor. She asked me how I would feel about it. Right. I said, I'm all for it. Let's give it all the publicity we can, especially the the plight of the carers as well, to highlight that as well. And and you became something of, uh, is this right, a sort of advisor to the scriptwriters? Did They, they consulted you about various... Uh, well, they, they did um, consult me in, in the first place. They, they invited me to a script conference and they asked me questions. But the scripts have all been so beautifully written, I've never wanted to change anything. The storyline has, has garnered a lot of attention and also awards, a couple of big awards have, yes. have come the way of the Archers as a result of, of tackling such a, a difficult subject. How was it for you personally acting out those scripts? Well, when I'm in the studio, I'm Peggy. <laughs> when I come out, I'm me. So there wasn't a conflict in that. Sometimes when I listen to it, I feel the... I used to feel the poignancy of it. Because some of them are... are, are you know, they're, they're pretty difficult to listen to. They're Jack becoming not just confused and forgetful and repetitive, but abusive and, and very truculent aggressive. and aggressive. Yes, yes, yes. Now, Roger never did that. He, was, he remained good-tempered throughout. Sometimes he'd be rather rude to other people, which was embarrassing, <laughs> but um, he was never as bad as Jack. Let's have some music then. Tell me about your seventh disc today, June. I'd like to have the overture to The Sleeping Beauty by Tchaikovsky. And that is to remind me of the years when Roger, Roz and I would go to Germany to see David dance. He was a classical dancer. He was a wonderfully frightening male carabos. And, and are there any memories you particularly have? of? I mean, obviously, it's a, it's a terrifically tough discipline when you felt that he'd reached his peak as a dancer. Yes. As he said to me, he said, I'm an actor without words. And he was. He was a wonderful actor. He could make you cry when he danced. And uh, this particular performance, we were sitting in the audience, and when he came out to take his... ...of your son David dancing, he was a very uh, accomplished dancer. Sadly, he's now dead. Can, can you tell me the circumstances of his death? Yes. He was tall, and he had some very hard choreography, lifting some lifts that he shouldn't have done and his back gave out and his feet when he stopped dancing his wife with whom he always danced needed a new partner so she found a new young dancer and I'm afraid the marriage broke up so David lost his career through having to give up because of his bad back and uh, lost his wife and his little daughter, whom he adored. And uh, I'm afraid he just took to drink. Although he didn't enjoy drinking, he couldn't stop. And sadly, eventually, as he knew it would, it killed him. And he wasn't living in England at that time. It must have been terrifically difficult for you as a, as a mother at a distance, knowing that this was happening to him. It was. It's, it's something that you live with every day. Mm. It's the last thing you think of when you go to bed at night, and it's the first thing you think of in the morning. I used to go over frequently, and he, of course, came over to England, but you could see he was fighting a losing battle. He got wonderful treatment in Germany, which was the reason that he didn't come back to England. I, I cannot praise highly enough the, the treatment that he got in Germany. And not just the, the sadness of a mother, but also being being a performer yourself and understanding. I mean, you, you're you still working at the age of 90. To, to see another person who's a performer have the thing that's so dear to them and that they're so skilled at taken away must have been yes. a great pain as well. Yes. It had been his life, you see, since mm -hmm. he was 11, when he went to the Rambert School. 
And what about your your granddaughter Claire? She 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 Claire lives in... is in Australia. Right. Yes, she was supposed to come over for my ninetieth birthday, but uh, I sent her a, a ticket. Something prevented her coming, and she's been out there for about three years. I expect I shall see her again sometime, but it's too far for me to go at my age. You've spent a lot of your time taking care of other people. It, it, it seems incredible that, I mean, first of all, as a teenager, you mm. had to restrict your own life to mm. be with your mother while she felt that she needed you there. You've spoken about Roger in the last few years of, of, of his life and, and then David's illness, and also you took time out of your acting for your own two children mm-hmm. when you adopted them. Um, what about the time that you have now, to, to a degree, although you have the sadness of the people who are no longer with you in your family, you, you have a life that is maybe more your own than ever. Oh, I think so, yes, yes. I'm, there aren't enough days in the week for all the things I want to do. I mean, I, I started a Scrabble club after Roger died. I joined the U3A Spanish conversation classes. I had a pretty good life, you know. <laughs> and what about Roz, your daughter? You're very close to Roz. Yes, oh, she's, she's a wonderful daughter. I remember David saying about her not long before he died, he said, she's a wonderful woman, and she is. She's a darling. And and does Roz ever try to persuade you that you might want to consider retirement? Oh, I don't think so. No, well, she knows it's good for me. It's the breath of life to me, acting. <laughs> Let's hear your final piece of music then, June. What have we got? Well, perhaps sometimes I might feel a bit down in the dumps. So I'd like the Hallelujah Chorus from Handel's Messiah. And I would climb up... I'll give you then, June, the Bible and the complete works of Shakespeare. And you're allowed to take a book. What's your book going to be? Well, I think I'd like something to make me laugh. So Three Men in a Boat by Jerome K. Jerome. Right, that's yours. And uh, a luxury? I'd like to take my Scrabble board. And one hand can play the other hand. Left hand can play right hand. And if you had to choose just one of the discs from today, which one would you choose? I think the uh, the Rodrigo Concerto de Aranwith. It's yours. June Spencer, thank you.